afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to our service this afternoon. It's lovely to see you all. The downside of such a warm welcome on a beautiful cold day is we have even mistier glasses than we might otherwise on a not so cold day. Um, um, welcome. So, as per last week, yesterday you might have started on your Advent calendar, but in our cycle of services, we're already into Advent week two. Um, but I'll talk about um, Advent and our stars a little bit later on. We're going to begin by lighting our second candle, and as per last week, I'm inviting you to channel your inner monk and say the words of the verse together. Peace is a candle to show us a path We fed by gods from a rage and our greed Friend to the envy for those in the shadows Violence and force, their dead and gores It sounds simple, but is far from easy to achieve. Yet you, O oh God, call us to peace, to wholeness, to healing, to oneness with you and each other, which of course rejects violence, but your peace is so much more. We try to box it in, a bit like we do with you, O oh God, saying that it is this and not that, only this far and no further. But peace, like you, is all-encompassing, touching our nations, our communities, and our souls. We can struggle to know what peace feels like. Forgive us. We can ridicule those who work for peace. Forgive us and restore us. We can seek peace through violent means. Forgive us, restore us, and set us straight. merciful God. You are the God of peace, Prince of peace, embodiment of peace. When we see and experience jealousy or greed, open our eyes to the gifts you have already given us. When we encounter fear and prejudice, open our ears to listen ever more closely to your children. When we are overwhelmed and do, and do not know where to turn, open our hearts to the wisdom of your spirit who guides us by the love upon the paths of peace. This Advent, May our hearts prepare a way for your Son, our Lord, so our hands may do your work in the world, our lips share the gospel with others, and our lives offer peace to many. For it is in you and through you that we have our being, God of yesterday, today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. My name is Jane McCartney and I'm a member of Moneyfeast Parish Church. <laughs> um, my favourite colour um, would have to be turquoise. Um, I just love the range of shades from deep blue to deep green. So I love turquoise. I, I suppose I have quite a lot. I, 
I like singing, I curl, I like swimming, I read a lot. I've enjoyed the garden, knitting. I'm trying to learn Russian, not very successfully. And I'd spend some time researching family history. My favourite meal usually is salad, although I think at this time of year I would opt for a plate of soup rather than salad, but uh, that sort of thing. What have I missed during the Corona virus outbreak? Main thing I missed is being with people and being with other people, the hugs, the, the fun you have together. I miss my granddaughters hugely at the beginning and although I'm lucky enough now to see the youngest one, I miss the older ones a lot. Um, I miss the singing, the psalms, the joining together and the fun and buzz of being in a group and the laughter um, and just generally getting together with folks. How have I lived out my faith? I suppose I've done that in many ways. Um, spent a lot of time thinking and I, first, I, at the beginning of the outbreak I thought this is a gift of time and space for thinking and wondering and just being rather than doing. Um, so I've thought a lot about my faith, about God. I've thought at God, I've thought with God and maybe maybe that's what prayer is. Um, I spent a lot of time enjoying our wee share of creation that we have here, the the beauty of the of our surroundings and trying to think that it's still a beautiful creation even on a horrible day or what we would call a horrible day that the, the rain is just part another part of creation um, and I've tried to be thankful for things I've tried to think of something positive and thankful each day I've also had quite a lot of spent quite a lot of time online uh, following different threads I've enjoyed the world in prayer weekly uh, emails. Um, I've followed a group called Sojourners in, in America which is led by Jim Wallace and it's been quite an interesting commentary on uh, the politics of America and the Black Lives Matter and the presidential election and some things and I actually met Jim Wallace a, a many many years ago in Edinburgh so he's kind of a, a hero of mine. Um, and I read a lot, I do a lot of reading. Uh, I'm reading poetry as well, which I find quite uplifting. Um, there have been positives, the positives of time and space, as I think I've already said. And I think the positives of looking at how the world healed, or the, the atmosphere, the climate healed when everything stopped in in March and April and I'm just quite sad that that has not been maintained but I think I've also seen positives in the way people behave towards one another and treat one another and that's uplifting as well and I hope that continues and that would be my hope and prayer for the future that in fact we, we see that we can do something about the environmental problems of our world but we can also do, do something about the way people live and, and how we can help them and support them and uh, the kindness that has been there, the, the commitment, the, the generosity, the, the heroism of some people in working with the, the pandemic. As far as what I'd like people to pray for for my, myself and my family, I think like everybody I pray that we're we're spared the, the, the illnesses that people have had and that we continue to, to go forward in, in faith and with hope uh, in the future and that for our children and our grandchildren, the world is a better place. Hi there, um, I'm Andrew McCartney and I'm a member of Moneyfeath Parish Church. I've been um, since I moved to Moneyfeath in 1983 with my parents and uh, before that I was baptised in Douglas and Angus. My favourite colour's got to be green. Um, played hockey for Money Feath and Latterly Monarchs and uh, we had uh, green strips for just about all the time. I played with them and uh, we had a little uh, hashtag FIG, the future is green. And uh, I believe they're still using that one now, but yeah, green would be my colour. As far as hobbies and interests would go, um, yeah, played hockey for many years, uh, field hockey, and played over a thousand games, uh, outdoor and indoor. I uh, got the bruises still to prove it, but I kind of gave that up four or five years ago. 
um, to spend a bit more time with uh, Annie on a, on a Saturday and then latterly uh, Serge as well which is great fun. Much rather go to um, Dobby's and have lunch rather than run about in the cold now. <coughs> um, other hobbies, uh, Officer and the Boys Brigade have been um, since I finished being a boy in 1995 and uh, love doing that. Really miss that during, during lockdown but you do, do love uh, Friday evenings and all that kind of entails. Um, hospital radio is another big thing, um, live on the radio 9 till 11, there's a wee advert every Sunday night, um, eking as much as I can out of the weekend I suppose. Um, that's great, that's stopped as well, so I'm looking forward to that getting going as well. Took over the role of secretary of that in March last year, um, and I've had to, it's been a, a sort of quick learning curve having to learn lots of different things uh, to do with health and safety for that and everything. Um, other hobbies, um, definitely would be uh, the ice hockey, um, follow Dundee Stars and at the home games I'm the announcer so if you're in there and you're listening to anybody speaking over the microphone it's normally me and I apologise for the, that embarrassing woo if you've ever been there. If you've never been there you should go, it's, it's good fun. Um, and yeah, spend lots of time playing with Sersha. That's my other main hobby and my favourite hobby. My favourite meal has to be spaghetti bolognese. I absolutely love it. Um, <coughs> like, yeah. Just spaghetti bolognese, garlic bread, and more spaghetti bolognese all the time. With a little bit of tomato soup, maybe as a starter. The toughest thing since mid-March, that's actually a really difficult and tough question. I've actually really, really um, enjoyed, it's not the right word, but but so much out of the, the time. I've worked all the way through, but worked from home from March till, till August. So literally got to see a lot of Sersha and see her grown up and see her going all through the stages, teaching her how to do everything she does, all the words and stuff like that, and, and just spend loads of time with her. And uh, if lockdown hadn't been there, I'd have been at work and maybe missed lots of it and, and you know, arrive back at half past five and then she goes to bed at six o'clock. So yeah, it's not been as tough probably for me as uh, a lot of other people. We've uh, <coughs> well, I've moved jobs in that time as well, um, from my guidance job in Baldragan to the same job in Arbroath. And uh, we've just moved house as we came out of lockdown as well. So it's uh, it's been all go. It's uh, it's been interesting, but yeah, um, yeah, I, I totally value that I've had maybe a much more comfortable lockdown than a lot of other people. Um, I've lived out my faith during the time, you know, lockdown time, just a lot of the time with with my job, um, looking after people in quite a vulnerable and and, and needy sort of uh, community, both in in, in Bodragan and in our both. And uh, just being there for them, being able to, to give them time, care, you know, listen to their needs and, and actually have the resources to be able to go out and, and help them. Um, and, and really just that's how they've done that as well. And also just being able to, to be there, be here with my family and love my family to bits all the time and, and just spend so much time with them. Um, things I have missed that, that my faith would normally have been involved in would be the Boys Brigade. We've not done... Uh, very much of that at all, um, for one way or another, and uh, you know, that's been difficult. But I think I've I've kind of found different ways of doing it, doing it other ways. My hopes and prayers for the future would definitely be that uh, you know everyone stays safe, really short term, you know, leading up uh, Christmas and and through that bit, and hopefully we can we can look after everyone till this uh, antidote has has been kind of passed through, and we'll get kind of our vaccines and. And, and kind of move on and then my kind of hope for that is that after that we, we we change a little bit and we're a bit more the way we should be rather than the, our old ways because I think you know people the community everyone's done so many different things during this time that have been amazing and if we just go back to all our old ways then we've maybe missed a trick and um, that's something I think I really hope that we, we can do uh, to the best of our ability. I'm absolutely blessed with an amazing family Absolutely crazy nuts, Ginger Sersha. You know, she's amazing, she keeps us all going. Um, so as far as prayers for anything in my life, just that we all keep safe, everyone uh, that I know and, and sort of friends there, and we just we just keep, you know, doing as best we can and, and, and getting on as best we can.
I realized last week and last night that although I've written sermon on my order of service, what I'm probably offering during Advent is more just stories. There's less of a kind of theological punch point over the next couple of weeks and more just a sharing of some stories to help us think and wonder. So with that caveat in mind, when you come to my sermon and go, well, that was a bit, I've given you the caveat. Um, We hear two stories, again from Genesis in the books of Samuel, but of two different women read for us by Barbara. Genesis 16, verses 1 to 6. Abraham's wife Sarai had not borne him any children, but she had an Egyptian slave girl named Hagar. And so she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Why don't you sleep with my slave girl? Perhaps she can have a child for me. Abraham agreed with what Sarai had said, so she gave Hagar to him to be his concubine. This happened after Abram had lived in Canaan for 10 years. Abram had intercourse with Hagar and she became pregnant. When she found out that she was pregnant, she became proud and despised Sarai. Then Sarai said to Abram, It's your fault that Hagar despises me. I myself gave her to you and ever since she found out that she was pregnant, she has despised me. May the Lord judge which of us is right, you or me. Abram answered, Very well, she is your slave and under your control. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai treated Hagar so cruelly that she ran away. Second Samuel chapter 11 verses 1 to 5 The following spring, at the time of the year when kings usually go to war, David sent out Joab with his officers and the Israelite army. They defeated the Ammonites and besieged the city of Rabbah, but David himself stayed in Jerusalem. One day late in the afternoon, David got up from his nap and went to the palace roof. As he walked about up there, he saw a woman having a bath. She was very beautiful. So he sent a messenger to find out who she was and learnt that she was Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent messengers to fetch her. They brought her to him and he made love to her. She had just finished her monthly ritual of purification. Then she went back home. Afterwards, she discovered that she was pregnant and sent a message to David to tell him. This week's stories of births and motherhood are perhaps less cosy than last week's. Last week we heard about Sarah and Hannah, women who had been childless but through God bore sons and bore sons that would impact the life of Israel. This week is almost the opposite way around. We have two women who have children and pregnancy foisted upon them, whether they wanted it or not. Start with Hagar, because she links into what we heard about Sarah's story last week. She is an Egyptian slave girl, and seemingly unbeknown to her, Sarai and Abram decide that she can have Sarai's baby if she can't. The word that's used in the translation we heard is Sarai gave Hagar to Abram. Now, I know that we still have a tradition of fathers giving away the bride, but it doesn't quite mean the same sort of thing, does it? 
I wonder how we would feel if somebody else decided to give us to, uh, us to another person, get us into some form of surrogacy without having the conversation with us first. We're heard that when she falls pregnant, Hagar becomes proud and starts to despise Sarai. Echoes of last week when Hannah's, Hannah was um, ridiculed by her husband's other wife. And Sarai, as you might imagine, didn't like this very much, and she thinks it's all Abraham's fault. Well, it kind of is, but, you know, she instigated it. Abram washes his hands over, gives her back to Sarai, and Sarai treats her so badly that she runs away into the wilderness while still pregnant with Abram's child. In the wilderness, in the desert, she is met by an angel from God, told that God has seen and heard her cries of distress, but nonetheless, is told to go back to Sarai. In the same conversation, she is told that she will have a son and that she's to name him Ishmael. Words that comes from the idea that God hears or God will hear. Cries of distress. She's also promised by this angel that Ishmael will too have a great many descendants. And Hagar is completely bemused by this. It's not often someone's visited by an angel, and moreover, not often a woman, let alone an Egyptian slave girl, visited by an angel from God. She wonders the question, have I really seen God and been allowed to live and tell the tale? Well, she has, and she was. She returns and gives birth to Ishmael when Abram is 86 years old. And it's after that child is born that God forms a covenant with Abram that, say, that sees his name changed to Abraham, Sarai's name changed to Sarah, and the rules of circumcision come into being. So when Abraham is 99, he is circumcised, and Ishmael is circumcised as well at the age of 13. And then we hear about Sarah having her baby, and as we know, Isaac is born. But when Sarah sees Isaac and Ishmael, an older teenager and a young toddler playing, she gets a bit upset. It's not clear in the Hebrew whether they are playing together or Ishmael's mocking Isaac. You can almost imagine that, can't you? Brotherly love and all that. But whatever it is, Sarah is not best pleased that Ishmael is hanging around, potentially teasing her son, potentially taking his inheritance, and demands that she is cast out once more. Abraham's a bit upset at this, Ishmael's his son, but God says, it's okay, do what Sarah asks. And for the second time, Hagar is cast out into the wilderness, this time with her son, and nothing but some food and some water. They wander in the wilderness, and when the water runs out, Hagar is so distressed she doesn't want to see her son suffer and die, that she hides him under a bush and goes away and cries out to God. And once again, God hears, answers her cries, brings her to a well of fresh water and promises her that Ishmael will too have many descendants. Bathsheba is the wife of Uriah, 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 yeah, wife of Uriah, and her husband is currently away at war. 
She's having her purification bath, which was required after our monthly period. And after that, she has these king's messengers fetch up at her door to take her to the palace. The king wants to see her. The king, if you notice in the first verse, that really should be at war with her husband, but is not. He's having his afternoon nap instead. So she's taken to the palace. The king has his wicked way with her, and she's sent home. The timing means she's just had her purification ritual. When she falls pregnant or discovers she's pregnant, it can't be her husband's, it can only be David's. So she tells David. And David ain't best pleased. He does everything to get Uriah to have sex with Bathsheba so he can get it to be Bathsheba's baby and not his. So he calls Uriah back and tries all sorts of Um, escapades to get him to sleep with his wife, he doesn't do it. And instead, David hatches a plan to ensure that Uriah is killed on the front lines of the battlefield. So there's Bathsheba, pregnant by a man, a powerful man who's not her husband, and her husband has been killed in battle. And what does she do? She takes the time to mourn that is required, but as soon as she's done, the king once again sends for her and marries her to be one of his wives. She bears their son. Only God is not best pleased with what David has done. And in order to punish David for his actions, this child becomes ill and remains seriously ill for a week before the child finally dies. This is a punishment for David, yet here's Bathsheba mourning once more. We are told in the story that David does comfort Bathsheba, quickly followed by more sex, and she gets pregnant again. The child she bears then is known as Solomon. We are told he is loved by God and even given a special God-given name of Jedidiah, which means the Lord loved him. When Solomon grows up, he's not expected to become king. He's one of the younger sons of David. But some trickery on the part of the priest Nathan and Bathsheba, Solomon is crowned king and becomes the third king of Israel and the king who builds the temple of God. In these two women, We see women who are, or who have the sexual attentions of men who are not their husbands foisted upon them. Some of you may have seen at some point the David and Bathsheba films that were produced in the 50s or 80s, where Bathsheba is a very glamorous, very attractive seductress. There's nothing to suggest that in the text. What both Bathsheba and Hagar experience is something closer to rape than loving intimacy. Yet both bear a child and both face further hardship in their motherhood, either being cast out or facing the death or illness of their child or indeed their death. It is a tough hand these two women have been dealt. And I don't like God very much in some of these narratives either because God's a bit complicit. God says, yes, send Hagar into the wilderness, it'll be fine. Now it turns out fine, but... mm -hmm. And it was God that insisted that David be punished by the death of his child with no, it seems, real consideration of Bathsheba's feelings. 
but we are reminded in the name of Ishmael that God also sees and hears the cries of these women. And they become mothers to great families or to sons who do great things. Ishmael is seen as the father of the non-Israelites, the Gentiles perhaps, and most particularly within the Muslim faith. Ishmael is the equivalent of Isaac. And in Solomon, he was the one that built the temple. And he was the one that had the wisdom of God that ruled all of Israel. It is tough to face suffering and abuse in the center of it. But there's a sense that even through the actions that we do not want, God can still somehow work. God still sees and hears our cries. And that whilst we face difficulties, we are never truly abandoned by God. just for you guys is to say that Dorothy Cullock hopes to be down with us um, for after the service if anybody's wanting to buy face coverings 
particularly Christmassy ones. Nada is clearly glammed up to the nines and is sorted, but, uh, <laughs> but Dorothy will be along after the service um, if anybody wants those. Um, a reminder of the Money Feast Befrienders Christmas draw, um, and there's loads and loads and loads of goodies. Um, the I asked this last week, didn't I? There's nobody here that has the tickets, but the number is in the impact. If you want tickets, um, you can phone um, and get tickets. Dorothy, not Dorothy, Irene is here on a Tuesday evening and I forget cash anyway, so there's a number there for you to phone an impact. Which reminds me, there is a pile of impacts there at the door. If you haven't had yours yet, or um, then please just lift one as you go out. And the other thing that's on the table are um, Nikki's Stuart's contact details. If you're up for doing that, um, having your door knocked, opening it up, shaking your head and slamming your door in the face of the minister, that would, if you're up for doing that, please um, contact Nikki. That would be great. Um, and just to come back to Advent, um, yesterday we started our journey with stars. Um, our first two stars are now in the windows um, and I have to kind of publicly say, she was in church last night, but I have to publicly say even still a big thanks to Mary Elder who has done an amazing amount of creative work in producing stars for us. My thought when I had this idea was basically a bunch of white stars with words on them and she has just made the most creatively amazing star. So there's um, Elizabeth and Zachariah are already up. Um, so have a wee look at them as you walk past um, and, and I hope you enjoy watching them coming up in the windows in the weeks to come. I've also um, tried to channel my inner Blue Peter presenter to um, start creating some videos on how to make stars because the other part of this is to invite you to put stars in your windows. Now if you've got nice stars or lights of stars please feel free to do them but if you'd like to make some um, you're invited to do that. So this week's star is what's called a Waldorf star. It looks kind of complicated. It's actually quite straightforward. You need two sheets of A4 paper and some glue and a pair of scissors to cut up into weird squares, but it's actually dead straightforward. And all of these things, um, if I can do them, most folk can do them. So this is the, the star, and so that's up on our website, how to do that. Um, and we're gonna, we'll, we'll put it on, for those who are not online, we'll put it also at the end of the DVD. So if you get the DVD, and you don't have online, then you can see that. So no squirreling out of this, all right, madam? You have to make one of these two, or something like it, okay? I'm picking you today, I'm sorry. Um, the other thing, the one last thing I'll say about this before we carry on is that throughout most of um, coronavirus time, I've been writing morning reflections um, on our, our Facebook page and I'm very aware that not everybody has access to Facebook so what I've done during this Advent Christmas epiphany time I'm using the words that are on our stars to write the morning reflection and I'm put, uh, they're also going to be on the website so if you're online but don't go onto Facebook you can see them on the website and I also hope for those that are not online to produce little booklets you'll be kind of a week behind us but it, it'll at least allow you to to read my musings and realize you haven't been missing anything for the last eight months, okay? So the invitation is to, is to take part as much or as little as you want and just to try and get a bit of kind of community spirit and cheer and things around this time of year in a very different year. So with all that said and the journey of Advent ahead of us, we bring our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession before God. Let us pray. God of all creation, we give you thanks that in your heart no one is forgotten, that those rejected or despised by human beings remain precious in your sight and loved beyond measure. We thank you 
for when we've known that precious gift in our own lives. For the times of love, acceptance, patience, forgiveness, and peace that you have offered to us. You are indeed our rock, our salvation, our guiding light, and we give you heartfelt thanks. God of justice and peace. We know we cannot have one without the other. We know that those who are oppressed, those who face violence, those who are shunned by society, will never know true peace while they have to keep looking over their shoulder. As we pray for peace, amongst nations and cities, within neighbourhoods and households, we ask your courage to seek justice, true justice for all. So God of creation, justice and peace, help us to understand the webs of connection that link us all across the globe physically, emotionally, financially, ecologically. Give us all the patience and insight to think seriously about how our actions in one place impact upon the lives of people in another place and how it is often the poorest, the least protected, the most exploited who are hardest hit by crises around the world. God of neighbourhoods, sorry, God of our neighbours and our enemies, we pray for those closest to us, our family, friends and neighbours, those whom we love across the world and in our homes. We pray for those for, with whom we struggle, all those who frustrate us, annoy us, or hold opposing views from us, be they across the world or in our homes. We pray for inner peace for each and every person, every and all sides, that peace may be known even in the midst of disagreement. For when we are heard and understood, relationships can be allowed to grow. God of yesterday, today and tomorrow, we give thanks for all those who have gone before us, raising and nurturing us, guiding and teaching us, all who share their faith in word, action and prayer, and rejoice that those who have finished the race are now at peace in your glorious presence through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, who prays with us now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sound the Savior comes, the Savior promised long. Let every heart exult with joy and every voice with song. He comes the prisoners to relieve in Satan's bondage hell. Gates of brass before him burst, the iron fetter shield. He comes. 
of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and all those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.